Hi gang, so there's been drama on the internet. I know, shocking. The makers of clickbait rage videos have been arguing with each other and as a Warhammer content creator, I thought it was about time I got a slice of the action. Sorry about the thumbnail. So let's talk about Primaris Marines, how and why they were introduced, why people apparently hated them and how videos like this really don't help. So, drama. This is going to be old and boring news in seconds, but as I write this, there has been drama in the Warhammer YouTuber um, community, I guess, as one content creator, this guy, Major Kill, accused another, this guy, Wes Hammer, of stealing his idea. And there was temporary and forgettable drama about it and calls for some sort of response video and, you know, the standard internet stuff. But what is that unique and incredible video idea stolen so perfidiously? Well, it's this. Why do people hate Primaris Marine shocked face clickbait words? So obviously this is drama for clicks, right? Not only is this subject done to death, a quick search brings up three pretty popular videos with identical premises straight away, and there are more similar ones below, but also YouTubers doing the same subjects as each other is hardly uncommon in the law space. And if you actually watch all these videos, and that's 40 minutes of my life I'll never get back, you can see well, that's fine. All three are pretty different in style and tone. They highlight different parts of this story and viewers might find different ones more or less approachable. Any of these guys might be your favorite YouTuber ever, or you might think they're derivative, egotistical and annoying. You can think that about me if you want. It's fine. There's loads of us to pick from. That's very much the point. As you can imagine, that's what loads of people said, so the drama blew out pretty quickly. Major Kill accused Wes Hammer of stealing his idea. Wes Hammer posted a response on a YouTube post saying that anyone can make videos about whatever they want, that the algorithm would pick the best video, which is an interesting thing to say given the rest of this one, and that he felt a bit betrayed by someone he considered a colleague. Many memes and commentary videos were posted to the internet, most of them pretty critical of Major Kill, and then he posted an apology video. Standard internet engagement farming drama. But it's interesting that this subject, and this phrasing of the subject, is the flashpoint for this drama. Primaris Marines, when they were introduced, did cause some controversy within the fan base. There were even some people who did hate them. And videos like this are not only designed to capitalize on that in different ways, but also to fuel it. So in this video, let's use this temporary internet drama to talk about an issue. How do the techniques used by content creators create and fuel over-dramatized anger like this? What effect does it have on the wider Warhammer fan base and hobby? And how do these three top scoring videos contribute to that? And also apologies in advance to Mr. Bones. He wasn't part of the original drama, but he is the top scoring video in this quick search I did. So he's in this too now. The price of fame, eh? Anyway, let's start by answering the question. Let's do the video. Why did people feel so strongly about a minor design change in a toy soldier? Primaris Marines were introduced to Warhammer 40,000 with a Dark Imperium box set in 2017, with the eighth edition of the game. Up until this point, Space Marines in Warhammer 40k have been pretty static for a while. Genetically engineered super soldiers, forged by the Emperor and split into chapters following the Horus Heresy, each a proudly independent army defending the Imperium on their own terms, recruiting their own replacements and attempting to keep alive the ancient genetic tech responsible for their creation, born from the genius of the Emperor of Mankind and his many human scientists, that'll be important later, 10,000 years before. 
This basic story and the design of the classic Space Marine and its Mark VII Aquila armor had hardly changed since the mid-90s, though the actual model range had been regularly updated and occasionally new units had been added to it. In fact, the Space Marine range had got so many kits over the years that it had the widest selection of units in 40k by far, and the faction was really popular, the poster faction for the whole game. The Space Marine range not only consistently outsold every other faction in 40k, but also outsold whole other game systems. But in 2017, the army changed. A whole new range of bigger, sleeker Primaris marines were introduced, with new weapons, vehicles and unit types that had never existed before, and with them came a new story that moved the timeline of 40k forward and explained all these differences. As the Imperium of Man faced an ever-worsening situation, the Prime Mark Robute Gilliman had returned and revealed a secret project. 10,000 years before, he had set a Mechanicum Magus Belisarius Call a task to improve on the genetic engineering used to create the Space Marines, and also to forge for them a whole suite of advanced technology. It had taken millennia, but with his return, he was finally able to order the deployment of thousands of these bigger, stronger Space Marines to save the Imperium and to bolster the existing chapters in their time of need. The old chapters, with their tactical squads and assault squads, their ancient histories and Mark VII armor were reinforced by these new, bigger, better Space Marines, with their all-new Intercessor squads, Hellblaster squads, and fancy Mark X armor. We got stories about them, additional kits of them, new vehicles for them, and it was pretty clear that while the original sort of Space Marines were still around, Primaris Marines, in both the lore and the model range, were to be the future. Okay, so what exactly were the reasons for a big change like this? I don't work in the Games Workshop Design Studio, so I can't tell you what the thinking was in the run-up to 2017, but from looking at what the Primaris Marines are, and how they were introduced, and how they're different from the old sort of Space Marine, we can infer what the design goals were. With Games Workshop, models always come first. The requirements of models, what model designs look like, and what models will sell are the primary factors in any new release, and then the rules and the law are just written to fit that, not the other way around. All that law is written to justify modeling decisions, or to market the results of those modeling decisions. So, let's look at the modeling decisions. The obvious first objective of the shift to Primaris Marines was to address scale creep. Warhammer has always had a bit of a vague relationship with scale, starting out at 25 mil, like other popular mini manufacturers of the 80s, then floating between that, 28 mil, 32 mil heroic, and then eventually just sort of a proprietary Games Workshop scale. And since the Space Marine ranges tended to be the first released in any new cycle, and any new models had to fit in with the existing ones, Space Marines had ended up being pretty tiny compared to all the other ranges in 40k. Scale creep on its own isn't a big issue for Games Workshop after all. The models aren't being compared to anything else, and bigger models tend to be easier to paint. The Space Marine range just hadn't kept up with everything else. In the lore, Space Marines are meant to be huge, but on the tabletop, they were barely as tall as a guardsman. So, first job, Space Marines needed to be bigger, but also their proportions had suffered as well. The famous crouching pose of old Space Marines had started to look sillier and sillier as all the other ranges were re-sculpted with much more believable poses and proportions. The entire Space Marine range, the biggest range Games Workshop sold, needed this remodeling treatment. But if you look at the new range, that isn't the only modeling requirement. Space Marines have always been intended as like a newcomer army. The bright colors, simple designs, and big flat plates of armor lend themselves well to new painters, and so they sort of became the starting point, the first army for most players. But over the years, that simple design had become more and more complex, even basic kits being supplied with loads of extra detail. And furthermore, the big four chapters, the chapters most commonly seen and marketed to new players, 
were the ones with the most detail added. The Blood Angels, Space Wolves, Dark Angels, and even Ultramarines had evolved into way more than just different colours of armour. Space Marine models weren't that simple anymore. From looking at the replacements, we can assume there was some desire to pare back and simplify the design of Marines, and while we're on that, the design of the armour was starting to look a bit dated. We can see that with the Primaris Marines, their armour design was moved on from the massive flares and gothic space knight look to something a bit more modern sci-fi and, though I dislike the word, tactical. They have slightly more high-tech looking vehicles that look appreciably more advanced than the other Imperial forces. There's a design choice here to make them look as elite as they apparently are in the Imperium through the design of their technology rather than just by sticking loads of golden detail on them. All these modeling changes might not be what existing Space Marine players were used to, but we can assume the design brief here is to create the perfect beginner army to attract newcomers to the game, and part of that is to keep them simple. We can see a lot of these same considerations if we look at Stormcast Eternals. Stormcast had been released a few years before as part of the first version of Age of Sigmar in 2015, and despite all the old Warhammer Fantasy players moaning about them, they were pretty popular amongst new players. Stormcast models are large and easy to paint with clear differentiation in what areas and materials are which. They don't have too much extraneous detail, they're mostly big flat plates, and you didn't have to change them that much based on what chapter, sorry, storm host you choose. And also because they're metallic, you can either paint all that small armor detail or just leave it all gold and it looks fine, which is really good for beginners. As well as these modeling decisions, there were also some gameplay ones, also inherited from Stormcast. One of the things about the Stormcast Eternals, especially when they were first introduced, is that each unit basically has the same weapon. No special weapon troopers or different options. And this was carried forward into Primaris Marines, another attempt to simplify and make them more accessible. Previously, a tactical squad might have a choice of loads of heavy or special weapons or various sergeant upgrades, all of which had their own extra rules and were slightly more complicated to use than a squad all armed the same. In fact, the idea of a squad all all armed with the same gun was more common in all the other armies, which is exactly the wrong way around for the starter faction. The new Primaris Marines were single weapon units, which is way simpler for people learning the game. From a marketing point of view, the Marine range was also colossal and full. A unit existed for every job. Loads of players had Marine armies already, very occasionally new units came out and they were all added to this massive codex full of tons of units and, I don't know, maybe some people bought them, but I think by 2017, releasing new marine units was kind of pointless. They were already the biggest selling army on the basis of relatively basic things like tactical squads and terminators, not new additions like stalker tanks or centurions. They sort of felt like an army that needed a shake-up, if only from a marketing point of view, what can we change that makes Marines interesting again? And finally, though probably the smallest consideration here, the Warhammer lore had been moving towards an evolving timeline for years at this point. For most of its history, Warhammer had been presented as a setting, not a story. A load of different wars and battles presented as happening over about a thousand years of in-world time that you could just pick between. But near the end of 7th edition, Games Workshop had been toying with the idea of having an evolving timeline where main characters get involved in the events of the day and where each campaign has an effect on the next one. So presumably whatever change is going to be made had to fit in with that. So there, I'm not a Games Workshop designer, but I reckon those would have been the parameters for the new Marine refresh around 2017. Those would have been the concerns built up over a couple of decades of 40k's development and Games Workshop at least felt they all needed to be addressed because they were. So, given how ranges have been refreshed in the past, what were the realistic ways to do this? Well, Games Workshop could have done what I'm going to call the standard practice range refresh. Talk about upcoming mysterious updates for a while, then in the few months before the release of 8th edition, the entire marine range just goes off sale, what we'd now call last chance to buy, and then 
bang, entire new marine range, starting with a very reduced selection of units because of manufacturing demand, and then slowly releasing updated kits. The new kits would have the new scale, new design, and new armor, but also just lose all their old weapon options. So there'd be a new tactical squad box in the new design, but they'd all have bolt guns and nothing else. And that's that. Crucially here, no lore explanation ever. This is just what Space Marines are now, and they've always been like that. Just ignore all previous lore. I mean, that's a pretty standard range refresh. That's how the Dark Eldar and Necrons were refreshed a few years before. Sometimes squad loadouts are invalidated when that sort of thing happens. Sometimes new models are incorporated, and the lore just says, yeah, They've always been there. That's standard practice. But given that you'd be messing up the armies of the most popular faction in the game, the armies that people own and build the most, that's probably going to annoy a lot more people than, say, when the same thing happened to Dark Eldar. And it's also a big risk for Games Workshop. Despite their size, the kits being retired were selling okay, and the new ones were unproven, and getting a new range up to speed would be a massive manufacturing burden for the factory, probably more than with a less popular faction. Realistically, you would probably need to keep the old kits on sale. So, new idea. We release all the new kits with the new designs, but we also keep selling all the old kits for a while. Those old kits, though, they're not getting refresh ever. Remember, we're going to phase out the old mixed weapon tactical squads eventually, so the new squads are going to have to be called something else. You release the single weapon intercessor units with the new scale and the new armor, and they exist alongside the old tactical squads. But again, no lore explanation. That's what most people who complain about Primaris Marines complain about, the lore changes, so we don't do any. Here's your new squads, here's your new models, completely different size and scale. Realistically, what happens here is that people think that's weird. And regardless of what Games Workshop say, they're probably not going to want to mix new marines and old marines in the same army. You'll end up with two unconnected marine ranges in all but name and all the people who want the new designs are going to start moaning about when the new design assault marines are out, and when the bikers are going to be updated to the new design, and they won't let up on that for years. So that's not ideal. So in order to soften the blow, maybe you come up with some lore, some in-world stories that explain why there are two very, very different looking marines for a while. Let's say Gilliman comes back and orders all the chapters to reorganize and also commissions some new armor and technology using heresy era knowledge. And the process is halfway through, and that explains why there's two sorts of Marines that look different. Okay, so the fans, well, why are the new sorts of Marines way bigger then? Why can't the old tactical squad guys just wear that armor? And you know, you can see where this is going. It's beneficial to sell the old and the new ranges together, which is not often how Games Workshop do things, but it's useful for the fans that are already building armies, but also because of the size of this refresh. It's the most popular line of models in the company, and manufacturing requirements are going to be massive if you try and do it all at once. But selling them both together is weird, so if there's going to be any lore explanation that makes it make sense, you're going to have to come up with a lore explanation for all of this. Why in the lore do our new marine range have different organization, different weapons, different armor, different vehicles, less crazy differentiation and unique bits and bobs, and are twice the size, but do not cross over with the old marines who are still there on sale. And that's essentially what we got, right? A story that explains why they're totally different and also a different size from the still currently available old marine range, specifically created to soften the shock of just invalidating everyone's army all at once. So were the fans happy with that? Of course not. There are some genuine reasons why people might have been annoyed at some of the changes above, and sometimes these three videos point them out. If you were midway through collecting a Space Marine army, you might be worried that the models you're building might be about to be discontinued, and not just replaced by newer models, but the units and rules and the way they've been equipped discontinued too. That isn't particularly surprising in Warhammer. When a new codex comes out, it's historically quite rare that you get to do everything you could do in the last one. We're talking about armies we build over years. That sort of thing's inevitable. I've got plenty of models, even armies, that I couldn't field at all anymore, or couldn't field without a little bit of reorganization. From plague marines in their old style unit loadouts to an entire metal squat army. But all right, you can dislike that. That's a fair thing to be worried about, right? And while Games Workshop have softened the blow by doing it over a span of years and years in this case, 
it does look like the firstborn will eventually go the way of the dodo. Also, you might have liked the previous lore and not liked the new lore. You might enjoy the wild differentiation between the chapters, or particular stories about specific characters who at the time looked like they'd be discontinued. At the time of the main Primaris release, the idea that all the characters just crossed the Rubicon Primaris and become big now wasn't a thing. So yeah, I mean, that might have been disappointing. But the law changes weren't that massive, really. Belisarius' call did improve on the Emperor's work, which is a really big thing, and he invented new technology, which is also a big thing. But in the law, those improvements were three additional gene seed organs, one of which is actually mechanical anyway, that took 10,000 years to make stable. And it's not like the Emperor was the only one making Astartes in the first place. They're named for Amar Astarte, the human scientist who led the project. The new technology is the same thing. Much of the Primaris tech is obviously built on existing Imperial weapons and armor. And the idea that some elements of the Mechanicum think it's heretical is part of the story. Some people said they disliked that Call was this new character, sprung from nowhere, fixing all the problems of the Imperium, and that it should have been a familiar character returned from the heresy or something. Um, I disagree. One of the things I dislike in 40k is how in a universe of a million planets and trillions of people, the same 20 guys turn up to every major plot point. But, you know, fine. You can think differently. You might just not like the new look as much as the old look. I mean, these tanks do have an awful lot of little knobbly bits on them, and that's not really to my taste either. If you're an existing Warhammer fan who, let's remind ourselves, are not the target market for this, there are a load of valid reasons why you might not like the new flavour of Marines. But these videos aren't called Why Were People Slightly Disappointed by Small Changes to Primaris Marines? These videos are called Why Do People Hate Primaris Marines? I've been disappointed by some changes made by Games Workshop before. There are plenty of models I don't like, or models that I do like but I couldn't get, or lore changes I just wasn't that fond of. But I can't imagine feeling anything other than a slight annoyance at it. It's not important. I'm sure there'll be another model I like soon. I'm sure there'll be another story I enjoy soon. The law is essentially a series of stories designed to market toy soldiers. I'm not expecting that much. And games end. Things stop being made. Novel series wrap up. Characters die. I can't imagine feeling anything as strong as hate over this. The reason people hate Primaris Marines has very little to do with any of those decisions, and much more to do with videos like this. Okay, non-Warhammer section. If I was like Philosophy Tube or something, there would have been a title card there, and I'd now be in a latex catsuit in a spaceship, so just imagine that. The polarization of opinion in everything is a well-documented feature of modern online conversation for a load of reasons. But its effect on nerd properties and the rise of the idea of fandom is kind of interesting. In the real world, the level of connection afforded by the internet over the last couple of decades has allowed groups of people to find each other and build communities much more easily. And a lot of the social progress we've seen has been the result of people, particularly people in various minorities, realising that they're not alone, being able to talk to other people like them, and then to put their hands up and say, hey, we've been here all the time. But only now have we realised there are loads of us, and these are the struggles we as a community face. This is known by the sometimes disparaging term of identity politics. There's then a load of pushback from more conservative people who don't want to have to change their worldview to accommodate for the fact that these people exist, and hence the bin fire of the internet. Identity politics is falling out of use as a term, particularly because it's been so overused in criticism, but I'm going to use it here because the idea of identity is really important to how fandoms work. Because that same system also works for stuff that isn't important. The level of connection afforded by the internet allows groups of like-minded hobbyists to find each other and build communities around their favourite thing much more easily, and this means people are much more likely to go deep into something they like, maybe even to start to identify as that 
thing. The language of identity politics, absolutely valid when we're talking about a persecuted minority, sexualities, ethnicities, or disabilities, is then pulled over into all sorts of other things too. Things that are choices. You're not just someone who rides a bike to work, you're a cyclist, part of the cycling community. You don't just go jogging, you're a runner, it's part of who you are. And you're not just someone who likes Star Wars, you're a Star Wars fan, part of the Star Wars fandom. It's part of your identity, part of your sense of self. And that's a problem because this isn't really a movement you're an equal part of. It's a product owned by a company who sold it to you, and you just like it. You have no control over what they do with it. If you define, in part, your sense of identity by being a Star Wars fan, then the company you own it, just changing it, can feel like an attack on you. Suddenly, the IP being changed is a threat, and the language of genuine identity politics is co-opted, so fans are being persecuted by a change, or by their inability to access their hobby whenever they want. And since this whole process is so tied up in ego and how people construct their sense of self-identity, it's then really easy to fall into the same conversations as real-life identity politics. The Star Wars fan group is being attacked by the feminists group. The Warhammer fan group is being attacked by the woke lobby, etc, etc. Even if they're very different things, the language and the way we talk about those identity groups are very similar. This is all stuff that's been going on for ages across all all sorts of different nerd properties, a move from fans thinking of properties as a thing they like to thinking of them as a core part of who they are. And it's encouraged a bit by the fact that we nerds have always tended to see ourselves as a bit of a persecuted group anyway. But Warhammer has a couple of characteristics that make this even worse. First, Warhammer can be a particularly all-consuming hobby. It's easy to spend a lot of your time on Warhammer. Seriously, try starting a YouTube channel. As well as playing the game, which frequently takes up an entire evening plus travel time, a Warhammer fan might spend their spare time painting for hours and hours a week, while listening to Warhammer audiobooks or idiots like me, or reading novels and constructing lists in their spare time. Games Workshop sort of encourage this. One of the selling points of the Warhammer hobby is that it includes so many different things, connected in such a way that there's a real benefit to doing more and more of them. You get more points in events for painting your army. You you get more information on how to paint the army if you read the law. Also, this weird in-group persecution complex is heightened by the fact that Warhammer has actual factions. There's a tendency, especially amongst newer players, to feel like they have to pick a side and then support that side, almost cosplaying as their chosen models. Why don't my faction get enough lore, or enough wins in the lore, or enough new models? You're not just someone who likes a toy soldier game, you're an Eldar player, and you and your fellow Eldar players have been treated unfairly by Games Workshop. You're owed those new models, and Games Workshop's doing those Eldar players dirty by not updating your range as much as some of the other ones. Even for nerd fandoms, this is relatively rare. You don't really see D&D fans complaining that their chosen species have been done dirty, and as the community of known players we've been discriminated against by Wizards of the Coast. Because in D&D, you're encouraged to play a new species every time you start a new campaign. In Warhammer, the inherent quality that it's a game where you pick a faction and then play against the others encourages this sort of ideological cosplay, especially online, where you can hide behind a character and, well, pretend you're a purifying Black Templar if that's the sort of thing that appeals to you. But the last issue with Warhammer is the one we're actually here for. The relationship between content creators, clickbait, and the existing persecution complex of the fans. Scene change, title card, I'm probably dressed as the devil now. Clickbait works in a number of different ways, most of which skirt the line between marketing and just lying, misleading people as to the amount of content they're going to get when they click on that link, or making something sound way more urgent than it actually is. But one of the more interesting ways clickbait works is by playing on your sense of identity. When we click on something that expresses a strong opinion that we agree with, that reinforces our idea of the sort of person we are. Yeah, we're someone that agrees with that. 
But the thing is, we get the same reinforcement by clicking on something we disagree with. Strongly disagreeing with that also reinforces your sense of who you are. It feels good to have strong, certain opinions on something either way, and what we call rage bait plays on that. One way to have successful clickbait is to express a strong, polarised opinion. This, of course, affects everything, but in Warhammer it has a weird effect because it's still one of the smaller of the nerd hobbies. Unlike Star Wars or Dungeons and Dragons, mainstream news sites, even mainstream nerd or gaming news sites, don't really report on Warhammer. So in our hobby, a huge amount of the people involved get all of their behind the scenes news and all their knowledge of what's coming from content creators and content creators are incentivized to have a polarized opinion because clickbait means clicks and clicks are how they get paid. This is even more specific for lore creators. The universe of Warhammer has a colossal and impenetrable amount of lore and primers to that lore are only really available in great big rule books, which means that for a lot of new fans, content creators are also their main source of story information. Fundamentally, if you're one of those Star Wars fans who just has a really strong opinion on The Last Jedi, that opinion is at least likely to be built on the fact that you've seen all the Star Wars movies. But if you're a Warhammer fan whose knowledge of the lore is based on a YouTuber who has a vested interest in making this sort of video, it's likely you're going to come out with a much more polarised opinion. The result of all these factors is a fandom of exceptionally entitled fans who see everything they slightly dislike as a personal attack on their hobby, and for whom every release, announcement and delay is a grave insult against their identity, egged on by a community of content creators whose income depends on reinforcing those polarising opinions. Opinions. Because being a hobbyist is an identity, how much you care can be seen as how much of a fan you are. Getting angry is proof that you care, proof that you belong, proof that you're the real fan. So every new release is a Games Workshop fail, or too late, or an insult for not being the model you're waiting for. Releasing, say, a limited edition product, a normal thing that all companies do, is evil fun. FOMO marketing, any change to the law, especially to attract new players, is woke or pandering or being forced down the throats of the real fans. Why do people hate Primaris Marines? Because they've been encouraged to take a silly toy soldier game way too seriously. In the case of Primaris Marines, and videos like this, we end up with a sort of vicious cycle. Every story about Warhammer is polarised as hell, so the fan base react to anything in insanely entitled ways, so some people really do hate Primaris Marines. Which means videos like this can be made and be accurate and so on. Right now, one of the most popular rage bait video subjects is the release of The Old World, which is currently spawning a lot of Old World Fails videos. And if those videos discourage people to buy the game, and then it does fail, then those creators can make a video about how The Old World failed. Hi, Editing Ian here, and while I actually edit this together, the current talking point is that a number of model kits for Age of Sigmar are being retired. From the hundreds of kits out there, some are being taken off sale, presumably they weren't selling, or they clash with new designs, and some others, particularly Beasts of Chaos, are being moved over to the old world so that product lines are kept separate. None of this is particularly crazy for a large company with lots of product lines, and Beasts of Chaos will get free Legends rules so people can keep playing them in Age of Sigmar if they want. Here's how the Old World Facebook group reacted, and here's how YouTube did. Games Workshop trashed Age of Sigmar. Games Workshop lied and killed Sigmar. They just killed Warhammer. Click my link and hate everything too. So another good example there. Anyway, this is going to feel quite anticlimactic, but back to Marines. So. Within that context, how do these three videos contribute to that?
How much angry, entitled nerd rage are they trying to generate? In what way are they capitalising on or encouraging that cycle? I'm not a regular watcher of any of these YouTubers. I don't watch a lot of other Warhammer lore tubers because it's a bit weird. But I was aware of Major Kill and Wes Hammer before. None of the three are really the style of delivery I enjoy from a video, which is fine, but watching them does immediately put the lie to the original drama. Major Kill complained that Wes Hammer stole his video, but this is fine because they're all doing it really differently. Also, none of these are really that bad. If we were looking for exaggerated rage bait Warhammer videos, there are way worse ones out there. I'm looking at these three because of the subject matter of this video, because of the original drama that inspired it, and because they're the top three results. While none of them are the worst, there are some glaring and sometimes worrying differences in the way they bait and encourage the audience to drive engagement. So all these videos, including mine, obviously have exaggerated clickbait thumbnails designed to make a relatively minor thing sound much, much bigger than it actually is. They're sensationalizing the problem. And mine's especially bad because I'm the hypocrite making a video about why this is meant to be bad. But in terms of content, Mr. Bones is probably my favorite one here. Say you have a dude, a dude with friends. This dude collects space marines, but a space marine versus Tyranid box comes out. So, what do you do? You get your friend to go half seas with you on a discounted set of miniatures, and maybe some new miniatures too. And boom, you just converted a new person into bank debt. Again, I'm not a fan of the delivery style. I'm going to say, this shit, whack. This shit, whack. This shit, whack. But the content here is pretty good. He launches straight into the subject matter of the video, no pauses for sponsorships or anything. He explains the issue with scaling and the new story elements, and explains how this wasn't that big a departure from the previous lore, and then he points out that... If 40k fans are anything, they are violently hateful about any change or announcement GW makes. Look at this. What the fuck is this? So yeah, he's on the money. The people hating this were kind of overreacting. He does lean a little into the evil Games Workshop trope. And it made the sales for that miniature kit tank as you kind of force the new Primaris version down people's throats. Yeah, old product became old and new product was new and that was therefore marketed, like everything. But generally, the tone of this video is that people were just overreacting. So, how does this rate on what I've just dubbed the hate-ometer? How much clickbait and rage bait do we have here? Well, pretty low. The thumbnail does the standard over-sensationalizing, but generally this video is a bait and switch. If you came here looking for validation to hate Space Marines, this response is pretty reasonable. In fact, I have no problem with this video or with this YouTuber. Mr. Bones is only really included here because he was the top response on the search. So well done, Mr. Bones. Let's move on to the two more controversial characters. First, the accuser, Major Kill. So this is the oldest and the most viewed video and I was expecting this to be one of the most clickbaity. When I first encountered Major Kill, he was doing a sort of Aussie man reacts thing for 40k, and he's made a name for himself by being a sort of deliberately arrogant, edgy character. Ultramarines were the best, and all other marines wanted to suck them off. Exactly the sort of person who I thought might really lean into the Games Workshop hate fan stuff, but actually, it's not that bad. After getting through two and a half minutes of ads, he basically brings up the common complaints and gives lore examples as to how they weren't true. And while he sometimes agrees that change is scary, the general tone is that even after almost four years, some people are still pissy about it and continue to sink time into the same memes that were never funny in the first place. The delivery isn't to my taste. Simultaneously making space marines not look like they have some kind of overpowered Down syndrome. But yeah. And if you hate them because you just can't stand the new helmet design, then just chuck a firstborn helmet on a Primaris body. That, or just eat a bag of dicks. Over to the Rageometer, and I'd say this is, again, actually not that bad. It's a bit of a bait and switch. It, the title and thumbnail over-dramatize the issue, but it doesn't really encourage the sort of nerd rage we've been talking about beyond that. In fact, it's pretty obvious that Major Kill was like trying to farm some drama here, because if he actually had an issue with someone copying his idea, the Mr. Bones video is a lot more similar than the Wes Hammer one. 
The Wes Hammer version stands out from the other two. Again, I'm not a regular viewer, but Wes Hammer's a massive channel that's hard to ignore, particularly because of his delivery style, which is like, I guess, hyperactive American gaming presenter. Back in 2017, with the dawn of 8th edition quickly approaching, we got our first glimpse into a new era of Space Marines. It's fast and chirpy and upbeat and like not really aimed at 40 year olds like me, but obviously does really, really well with people who aren't me. It's also, in some ways, the video with the most effort put in. I mean, none of these videos are exactly complex. They're all voices over slideshows, which in the case of Major Kill and Wes, who do appear in their videos, makes these ones seem a bit throwaway. But this video feels the most tightly scripted and I guess, pro influencery We're gonna get into all that and a whole lot more, but first a quick shout out to this video's sponsor. It takes the longest time to actually get going after its ads, with calls to keep watching a few times. It's delivered in a much more neutral, reporterly style, which lends it an air of truth, while Wes essentially goes through the same story as the other two. This is about the Primaris Marines and the resulting controversy that would have long lasting implications. Unfortunately, what he then does with that story is reinforce a lot of the things we just talked about. It seems like literally everything they sell now is FOMO. Limited time only, available only while supplies last. So limited edition products, again, are evil FOMO marketing. If you had any hope of playing in a tournament and not coming in dead last, you needed to shell out hundreds of dollars for the new models. You need the newest models to compete. It was like Games Workshop was telling us that all of the characters that we've grown to love over the years, characters that were part of our army's personal lore, or maybe space marines that we created for an RPG or fan fiction or whatever, the lore was telling us that they no longer mattered, that they weren't important, that they were going to die and be phased out and forgotten. Games Workshop are stealing and then killing off your original characters. And then the general tone throughout this is best shown by the use of this word a lot. Enormous amount of disrespect, disrespect, disrespect it, disrespecting, disrespect it. The fan community of Warhammer, you are being disrespected by a company updating a model range. He has a short section at the end where he admits that he likes them now, now that all his OCs can all cross the Rubicon Primaris, but the majority of this video, for all of its level and reasonable tone, is essentially agreeing with the nerd rage. It's not at the top of the hateometer. The thumbnail is clickbaity as hell, but not inaccurate, particularly because he actually agrees with the complaints. But of our three videos, this one leans into the aggrieved entitled gamer stereotype way more than the other two do. But if you wanted to encourage an us v them attitude to the hobby, this video of the three does the most to validate all those points. And because he's by far the most professional, I'm loath to think that's completely an accident. Figuring out what all three of these creators really think is difficult. I don't watch enough of these three channels to know if their opinions in these videos are actually their opinions in real life, which has made me a little cautious about this video as a whole. Despite everyone thinking of us all being part of a creator community, in reality, my relationship to these three is the same as yours. They're just someone on a different continent who makes videos. I don't know them. I'm sure all three are probably lovely in real life and might even have videos where the issues in here are all addressed. With the nature of clickbait, it's really hard to tell. With Major Kill and Mr. Bones, while obviously there's a performative aspect to their channels, I'm reasonably sure that these are mostly what they think. Their online personas seem to be the sort of character whose audience expects them to be snarky and sarcastic, so the bait and switch nature of the videos is at least on brand. The Wes Hammer video is more difficult to pass though because his online persona is a lot more professional and honest sounding. Does he actually believe all this entitled nerve rage? Or is this a cynically constructed video designed to maximize the algorithm? Or is he just very aware of his audience, which I would guess skew a lot younger than the other two and are more likely to buy into that drama? It's worth saying that it's much more likely new players will see this. Disrespect and disrespect it. Disrespecting and think that's how the Warhammer fandom works instead of a more reasonable response. 
But to the casual viewers, what these creators really think behind the scenes doesn't matter. All three of these videos, to some degree, engage with and capitalize on the angry, entitled fan base. Even the two videos with the more reasonable takes still use the drama generated by titles like this, Why Do People Hate Primaris Marines? as, you know, regular old-fashioned clickbait, and that normalizes the sentiments, even if the videos then go on to criticize them. As I said earlier, there are far worse creators out there, but I think the normalization of these extreme takes encourages every take on the hobby to be extreme. But should content creators even be expected to take the moral high ground, or are we all just collectively okay with them following the money and posting whatever gets them clicks? Is a thumbnail like this clickbait or just good marketing practice? How much creators lean into techniques like this, and how much audiences are okay with it, accept it as just part of the influencer experience, is a moral grey area. Whenever I mention the ethics of YouTube and clickbait and making money from YouTube, I get a number of comments along the lines of, don't worry, Ian, you've got to make money somehow. Do what you need to do to get the cash. But I would encourage viewers to think of YouTubers less as their buddy who needs to make some money and more as the small businesses they are. Businesses engage in marketing and hype their product, but there's a line most of us would draw where the marketing becomes lying or sometimes where their business practices deliberately spread misinformation or encourage really toxic behavior in their customers, most of which we'd have no issue calling out as unethical. But when it comes to content creators, we seem to have a much higher bar, a more accepting of things that we'd never accept from a company, lured in by the parasocial relationship. But YouTubers aren't your friends, they're businesses who make money off of your time, and their business practices should be judged in the same way as any other business. All three of these videos, all four of them, are to some degree misleading adverts designed to get you to consume their product, and the techniques they use to drive that engagement should be examined and criticised and sometimes called out. A lot of the stuff I've mentioned isn't unique to Warhammer, but Warhammer is affected by these practices. And as some of the very public faces of the hobby, the way in which content creators choose to portray it affects how people, especially new people, interact with it. Why do people hate Primaris Marines? Well, a load of different reasons. But videos like this don't help. And if you'd like more videos about the weird world of Warhammer, there should be a little box popping up to your right. And if you'd like to support the channel, you can click all the usual buttons, or there's a link to the Patreon below where you can join in with Tale of Four Gamers and Book Club and get access to early videos. See ya!